And some of you as you came in. Um, we're going to now take these use cases and talk about what we did as a technology platform to take our vision um, and kind of enable that at an enterprise level. So, um, what we are and what we aren't. So, we are not an application. We don't pretend to be an application. We don't want to be an application. We're a platform, a blockchain enabled platform that gives you all of those capabilities that Frank just alluded to a second ago. So, GDPR compliance, HIPAA. We just passed our SOC 2 Type 2 audit. We're going through another type of audit right now with a client. So we have gone through and done these kind of things to enable this platform to hold that kind of sensitive information. Within there, we've got the blockchain enablement. So we have all the capabilities that you normally think of blockchain. It's distributed, it's immutable, there are contracts that can be written. We'll talk a little bit more about what we call consent contracts shortly. But what we provide is a little different in the sense that what we're doing is giving a big data platform to the blockchain. So if you think about blockchain, you think about Bitcoin or Ethereum, typically are the first ones that pop to mind. There are flat files sitting on a system. The data is rather small in terms of enterprise data. And there, the queries you do want to enter typically for a transaction or a block. There's really not that type of enterprise query where I need to know all the patients who are under the age of 50, who are male, who are, at, you know, live in Colorado, and, so all these kind of analytics or all these kind of population statistics that you may want to do, or even data that you may want to do a transactional type thing to, like an application that sits there and does uh, your EMR data or something. So how do you query a blockchain in any kind of meaningful and speed, speed way? And that was one of the problems we wanted to tackle when it came to comes to blockchain methodologies and principles. So we buried a big data engine, so instead of storing blocks and transactions in a flat file on the computer on the distributed node, there's a, there's a big data engine behind it. So what that gives us, that gives us the ability to do analytics on chain. And so that's kind of important. A lot of companies right now are using blockchain public hashes to store immutable hashes of their data. And that's all great because it provides a way of proving to the public that whatever they have in their off-chain database is immutable and they can prove it. And those are all wonderful and great things. We do that. But there's a wealth of information within the block itself. Who's authored it? Who owns it? What time did it show up? What voters consented to it? When did it get consented and accepted into the chain? This, this is all valuable information that can be leveraged for analytic purposes. So by combining the two, we kind of brought the best tools together. Now you don't have to go query an enterprise database, you don't have to query the blockchain, you don't have to do two things at once, you can start with one, one spot. Consent. We'll talk a little bit about what an asset is in the merge chain shortly and what that means from an ownership perspective. But what we've enabled is the ability for a data owner to consent their data, a subset of their data, partial data, and to any other entity. So for instance, if I've got my medical record information in here, and my primary care says, well, in your last physical, it's time for you to go see a cardiologist. I expected something, you should go see them. How many people have had to go back to their primary care, fill out a paper form, wait for them to photocopy it, pay 20 cents a page, maybe they fax it for you, but there's this manual process in the digital age of getting your own data out of your primary care, a hospital, or any other place. What if I could write a consent contract on a chain that said, between now and the next six months, I want Dr. Smith to be able to view all my lab data and all my physicals for the last two years. And what if I want them to be able to revoke that consent contract at any point in time? Or maybe I only allow them to look at it for a year. So what we did is we put the data ownership, the ability to share data to whomever you want. And we did that at a level where you can dictate, again, what type of data you want, and maybe even partial data. So I already kind of talked about security and the way that we handle HIPAA data. So unlike a traditional blockchain that's out in the public, we can't allow HIPAA data to just land on somebody's desktop that they have in their basement sit there in the open and be clear. So there's certain regulatory security that we have to wrap around the data. And that's where we add the security layer. Monetization. So this is a big thing. Obviously, we're living in an age where you hear about Facebook and Google making money off of all of our personal data that we happen to share. Um, I think the last number I saw was Facebook earns about $17.24 a quarter off each of us if we have a Facebook account. So that's a lot of money that somebody is making off our information. There are researchers out there, for instance, who want 
use cases. They need patience. They need information to do their research. What if I said to a researcher, well, I'll let you use um, my information because I happen to have a history of Parkinson's in my family. You can use my genome and my information for a period of one year, and maybe I'll charge you and they're willing to pay some cryptocurrency amount for that one year. Or maybe I want to donate it for free, but I only allow them to use it for one year. So I can write a consent contract with it to them, and they can use that data for a period of time. So again, we have the ability to let the data owner control their own data and monetize it the way that they choose to. So <coughs> some of the principles of blockchain are super important when it comes to healthcare, but they extend to other verticals as well. And we'll talk about what the first chain does here, but smart contracts, we, um, we have functionality for smart contracts, but we have a specialized one called a consent contract that I was just talking about. Distributed networks. All the nodes within um, our network are distributed so that they act and look independently from one another. There is no one node that is a super node or an admin node or anything like that. They all act independently. They all can compete for consensus. They all work together in voting on assets that should be admitted to the blockchain. Of course, it's immutable. There is a way to keep track of any data that comes in. So just like other cryptographic uh, functions of caches and signatures and certificates, we track the data, we sign it, we make sure it's immutable. One of the things we do on top of that though is, um, in a cryptocurrency, if I do a transaction and I decide to pay you, you know, five ether for dinner for something or something, you're gonna pay me back and we exchange that. I never wanna go back and be able to edit that transaction. That's a public ledger, that's what it means to be a public ledger. That transaction between he and I occurred I gave him five either for some service or some goods in return. Does that work in enterprise data? The answer is no. I'm never going to live in my house my entire time. I'm going to move from one house to another over my lifetime. So I've got to be able to change my address and update it. But I want to be able to track that in such a way that we provide history on assets. So not only are assets tracked and immutable, but we also have the ability to allow an audit trail of an edit to an asset. So if I move from one house to another, you can actually see, as the owner of the data, I can pull the history of all of that asset and see how it progressed through the blockchain. So that allows us to do things like editing and updating so that, it, so that enterprise data use cases fit into the blockchain. The other thing we do is transfer of data. So maybe I'm talking about the fact that maybe I put a real estate piece of information in, or maybe here's a better healthcare model. My grandmother, who I just alluded to, had Parkinson's. She passed away a few years ago. What happens if at, the, at her death she has a contract that transfers all of her EMR data to me? So now I'm the owner of all of her EMR data. I can choose to now share that like it's my own data to whomever else. I can bequeath that to another research department, or I can give that to somebody else to go look at her genome and her, maybe her autopsy and all the other things that occurred to her as part of her Parkinson's research. So that's all the that's all wrapped around the ability of ownership. And we'll talk about what we call software data option short. And then identity. We talk about identity. Again, ownership is key in this platform. I have to be an owner. I have to have an identity in order to own that data. Typical Ethereum and Bitcoin transactions take, I don't even know what the current time is right now. It's was 12 minutes, 20 minutes, the last time when I saw a couple of transactions go through. So that's not gonna work at enterprise. So some of the open blockchain technologies right now just aren't gonna operate at speed to work enterprise data. What happens when we're trying to handle 10 million claims in a given quarter for a hospital system? You can't run at that kind of speed. So one of the things we've done is by changing the way that uh, proof of stake works, we use a modified proof of stake versus a proof of work so that we cut down on the time to adjudicate a transaction. So I've already started kind of leading into the slide a little bit. We talked about the big data uh, blockchain aspect of it, how instead of storing stuff on flat files, the blocks and the transactions themselves are stored in a way that are queryable through a big data engine that gives us some of the speed and research and analytics we like. Um, we're already in this distributed network. So some of the things that we can do to that is add other types of swarm intelligence around the data. So part of unlocking the blockchain is to use the blockchain as a foundational piece, but don't stop there. The idea is to then unlock that information and use it in other ways of doing AI and artificial intelligence. And we'll talk about Minecraft shortly as an extension of that. 
consent and sharing. Again, I already alluded to how we can do consent contracts, what that looks like, how that how that owner can do that um, at any point in time they want. They can revoke that contract at any point in time. Um, for the sake of time, Frank's already hit on sovereign ID, um, privacy, and security. Um, we are again HIPAA yeah, GDPR compliant. We do follow all of those regulatories. We follow this standard. We passed our audits. Um, there are a couple hospital systems that we are partnered with that we have passed their security audits. One would be one of the larger ones in the U.S. And then we have passed their, their internal security audits. So we've been through this. We understand all the ins and outs of HIPAA data and what that means to protect and safe. So familiar interfaces. I haven't gotten to this. This is, this is kind of a fun part of the platform. So one of the reasons we went with a RESTful API interface for developers is because then it unlocks the ability from anywhere to interact with the version. So whether it's a web app, whether it's a thick app that you're running somewhere, whether it's your own server. But there are aspects to the interface for transactions, what um, database people will call an OLTP. So if you're normal transactions, I want to create an encounter, I saw a surgeon on this date, I had a surgery, all those are transactional, is that a transactional before an encounter? So all of that is available through the API in what most people would normally call a CRUD operation, is create, read, update, and create type operations within the API. But there are also support for bulk ingest. So there's a robust engine for doing ingest at flat file levels. A lot of hospital systems provide their data as XML and CSV and Excel formatted data, and, and God knows what else I've seen in my uh, time with hospital systems. But they also put out EDI, and if anybody's familiar with EDI, uh, one of the big ones is 835 and 837, so we do a lot of processing with claims remittance and claims acceptance and claims adjudications. So how to get that bulk information into the blockchain as fast as possible. So there are interfaces for doing EDI transaction processing. Our bulk ingest engine also puts some controls in your hands of doing mapping and transforms at a regular level. So that if you do get data from different sources and you know they all vary differently, you can set up information or set up instructions for the ingest engine to do transform the bulk ingest. We have done HL7 and Fire. Um, HL7 is more of a streaming interface rather than something that would be restful. So at an HL7 protocol level, that would be something that would be set up um, usually on a hardware VPN between our site and some source site, whether it's a hospital system or practice or something. That. So that, that does come in a little different flavor, but HL7 is supported. So this, for, this slide is kind of the first slide I started talking about, and kind of break it down a little bit deeper. Um, we do work with public chains, and we work with a couple different ones, Ethereum and um, another partner that has one for identity. And we do that for various reasons. One is so that we can provide public caches. So if you have a business case where you want public caches written of your data, then we can do that and interact with an Ethereum type network or something like that and put hashes out somewhere for you to um, be able to publicly verify the information you choose to. Um, more importantly, the Ethereum uh, interaction of the for that monetization piece, where data has, is, as a currency has value and as an owner, I want to be able to interact and have monetization around that. And we have work with Ethereum on that aspect. Um, the middle there, um, each, each client, if you will, or each enterprise, or each customer gets what they call a data wall. And it's a, it's a walled off, garden wall, hardware uh, defined wall of information where your chain lives. Now that doesn't mean you can't choose to consent to another person outside of your garden wall or your vault, but that's up to you. Your data is maintained separate, it's kept, <coughs> excuse me, it's kept separate away from anyone else's or chambers. Um, again, the distributed app model, again, we have uh, provide professional services to help people build D apps or applications on top of first chain, but that's not our primary goal. We have one partner right now who came to us with um, money, an idea, and no staff, two people, and said, hey, we want to use the platform, we see the benefits of it, we don't have to build this, it'll save us time, but we need help getting onto it. And so we contract with professional <coughs> services to help get it. We are in the process of transition to go back to them and they'll own it and have their own staff. So from an application point of view, um, we have those services that are available to help that, but that's not our primary goal. Our goal is to be a platform. What are the 
they live in any any cloud. We actually are cloud agnostic, so we've done private network, private clouds with Amazon, Azure, and Google. Um, we have production sites in Azure and AWS. But you guys control Yes. Yes. In order to maintain SOC 2 type to compliance, we have to keep control. Um, we have on our roadmap uh, future capabilities that we'll get into at a later time uh, around the ability of what we're going to do from an encryption point of view that might allow us to open up and pass all this to distribute those loads publicly. But for right now, they're controlled in our program. So granular data ownership. So this is kind of the key idea around assets and how we enable some of the ownerships and consent contracts to work. At the center core of that diagram is a digital asset, whatever that might be. It might be my demographic information, it might be uh, my lab work, it might be my EMR, it might be a digital representation of my deed to my house or my car or something like that. Anything that you want to represent as a digital piece of information is put in the center of this wrapper. And then around it is the ownership items. So first chain handles single and multiple owners out of the box. So I can own data. Um, so in the case, I'll uh, reuse my grandma, I wasn't planning on talking about it. Today is the day, I guess. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's say my two sisters and I become share owners of her information. So that gives us both rights to look at the data, own the data, and then we can join, go into joint contracts to sell the data or give it away. So there's ownerships that occur, and ownerships don't have to be at an individual level either. So at an, individual, at an ownership, it's just an ID pair, a private public ID pair that identifies the owner. That could be an entity. Um, there are some cases where the client is going to write an application and they want to own all the data. Maybe it's all derivative work. So it's not actually going to be owned by an individual patient or person, the company owns it. But again, it's up to you to decide how you want to define ownership and the system is flexible enough to put one way or the other. There's metadata attributes and other attributes that can be tied to it as long as well as edge relationships. Now, edge relationships I'll talk about in a second because that's kind of important in the next slide. But what this does is Data cannot be viewed without other consent. Um, if I have a first chain that contains a bunch of EMR records and all of us have information in there, and I go to the REST interface and I go, I want to query everybody's data, I'm only going to get mine back. The system only allows you to see data in your own tube. Now, sir, if you give me consent to a consent contract to see data for a period of a day or two, then when I do a query, I'll actually get to see your data as well. At the end of the contract, my access to your data is cut off like that. So at a, at a query level, everything is wrapped, is controlled by this data ownership. Um, I don't think there's anything new here other than a couple of key um, points that I'll talk about at the bottom. So from a consent contract, I've been, all my examples have been one-to-one, -one, where I'm giving consent of my data to a doctor or to someone else, or <clears throat> to even a research uh, facility or a company. But we talked about GDPR a little bit. How many are familiar with what GDPR is? Okay, so GDPR has is one of those multinational uh, regulatory bodies that have regulations on how long data can be seen, how long it can, how long I can hold on to it before it has to be deleted, what my use cases are for that. So what we've done is built a layered consent contract model to it, so that we can model different regulatory bodies, whether it's corporate or national or multinational. That's sit. So, for example, here's a case that we're doing for a, um, a small sovereign nation where they want to, a person walks into a bank and wants to get a loan. The loan says, well, I need your address, I need your last utility bill, proof of birth, and I need your last genome test. What happens if the country has said that for credit and for loans, you're not allowed to share genome? So even though I, as a person, want this loan and I need it, and I consent to all these things, and I say, okay, here you go. The overarching regulatory consent contract won't allow me to share my genome to the bank. So the bank would get all the other information, but they wouldn't do that. So these, lay these contracts layer upon one another and have, um, have precedence to them in order to prevent that kind of sharing if it's not allowed by law and regulation. Life graph. So, one of the interesting things about data 
and especially the big data, is it's not in its ability to understand predefined relationships, but to understand its relationships as it expands into a graph model. So if, um, there are things called edge relationships in data that maybe I don't understand that this person is connected to this person because they both happen to share a common prescription that was filled by the same doctor. So there are ways that we can tag these individual data elements and these individual assets with the edge relationship information that allows us to then take and put a graph view on top of that blockchain data. Now we can actually look at that data in multiple dimensions and start adding different types of intelligence around looking for patterns, looking for unknown relationships that we didn't see before. And it allows us to provide a longitudinal view of a patient. So now we've got started to see not only the patient and what we know about them, but how did they relate to this doctor? And what is this doctor's affiliation with maybe a pharmaceutical company? So things that weren't inherent in the first quarter of the investigation are now being seen in third, fourth, and fifth derivatives of arches through a graph. And so I will end there for sake of time, and Amber's going to come up and talk about some use cases. Um, Amber? Yep. Yeah. Okay.